So as I said near the outset of this lecture, our bodies are always located in space and time. There's never a moment when our body is outside of space or time. And you'll recall from the week on power that disciplinary power involves structuring the spaces we inhabit and operate in in order to alterate our navigation, our physical bodily navigation and orientation within that space and also our senses of time how we perceive time and react accordingly. And all these the structuring of space and time uh, acclimate us to certain uh, ordered living conditions and drill into us certain modes of thinking and practices and inculcate in us certain habitual behaviors and dispositions. And like I said earlier, where the body goes, the mind follows. So a lot of disciplinary power is wielded on the body, which then affects our thinking, which then again reciprocally affects our actions in a self-perpetuating uh, reinforcement of this disciplinary power. So just as we uh, we originally identified disciplinary power in uh, prisons, and then I think we talked a little bit about uh, like factories as another one, and hospitals as another disciplinary space, gyms can be looked at in a similar way in which the people who inhabit these spaces, who enter into these spaces, are disciplined and discipline themselves into predisposed modes of thinking and behaving. So all that stuff we talked about on the discipline slide from a few weeks ago, we can apply it to fitness centers to see where it does and doesn't apply. So before we start our application, it's important for me to acknowledge that Gyms aren't an inherently bad or evil place. That's where we go to, to work out and to get fit. So it's important to be critical and to show the relevance of these theoretical frameworks we've laid out, but also to not get too cynical and to just, like I'm not telling you to burn down all gyms or to never go to a gym, but just to be aware of the power relation that exists in every space we occupy and inhabit and go through in our everyday lives. Because like I said, we can't escape power. The best we can do is be aware of it and aware of how it shapes us and how we can redirect those flows of power to reshape ourselves and the structures around us. So I'm by no means saying the gym is a, a bad place that you should avoid. Uh, I, I, before the pandemic, I, I went to the gym quite frequently. The, the image in this slide is actually from my gym. Uh, that I want to go back to very soon. Their restrictions are still a bit tight in terms of you have to sign up for a time slot, like a one hour time slot ahead of time. And they're very limited slots and spaces available. And for me, working out is a bit more fluid than that. Uh, it's not like I, I plan days ahead, like, okay, I need to make an appointment to, to go to the gym. So I miss the gym dearly, and I, I'm, I'm sure many of you are in the same position where you're working out at home now. And we can apply a lot of this, a lot of the, the panopticism to even working out at home and how the self-discipline, we carry that within ourselves, regardless of even if we live, uh, even if we leave the, the strict structure of, of a gym, we're still carrying that discipline with us to act accordingly and to conduct our own conduct. Uh, so, like I said, gyms aren't evil, but we can look at specifically like commercial gyms, like heavily commercialized, uh, like chain gyms, because they obviously um, operate by that prof that capitalist pro uh, profit motive, where they want to cut costs and maximize their profits, which is the the modus operandi of most disciplinary power. Like I said, it's too expensive to wield power directly and manually so disciplinary power uh, circulates uh, automatically and autonomously in a decentralized manner so that you know a prison doesn't have to hire as many guards because they just have that panoptic tower in the middle gyms don't want to hire a bunch of employees to to guard the the goers of the gym the members of that gym so there are various disciplinary techniques and strategies that commercial gyms employ to maximize their profits and reduce their costs by offloading the responsibility of discipline onto the members of the gym, onto the people who enter that space. So they act 
they behave obediently and, and act accordingly without having to be told to or intervened upon manually. So what's the first thing you do when you go to the gym? You got to pass through usually some sort of desk area where you show the person your membership card or usually most uh, typically you scan it on the front so that a person doesn't even have to be at the desk. But in order for you to get access into the gym itself, you usually need to go through some sort of turnstile and, uh, and scan something to confirm your identity. So right then and there, we have surveillance. We have some panoptic surveillance. Even without uh, a clerk or someone sitting at the front desk to, to, to say hi or whatever, you know you're being monitored because you know you scan your card that it's kept in some registry or system somewhere that you have entered the gym at this time. Just like the guard doesn't have to be in the panoptic tower for the prisoners to surveil themselves. When I worked the night shift years ago, I'd go to a 24 seven gym in the middle of the night. They very often didn't have any employees there that I could see. Probably just like one night manager who just spent the whole time in the break room. But that didn't stop me from still acting completely in line with how the gym wanted me to act. Because once you scan your card, you know that they know that you're there. And that anything that happens during that time could be traced back to you. So you already have this in mind as soon as you pass into the gym and pass that front desk. Okay, they know I'm here, so I better do something. I can't just go here and scan my card and hang out and leave. I got to work out. So that's the first uh, instillment of discipline. And then what do you do? You usually go to a change room and change into your uniform, your gym clothes. And there usually is a uniform, as we see in this, uh, this image. It's usually uh, runners and shorts and a tank top for a lot of them, or a t-shirt. Obviously, there are, there are practical reasons for this too, because it is comfortable, but there is a whole culture and, and fashion around what you wear to the gym in terms of your, your Gymshark brands or your Lululemon brands. And there's a, uh, already like a hierarchy forming of where you fit, where you belong in the gym hierarchy by high, how you dress. They kind of uh, determine your, your status. Just like how uh, in religious discourse, the, the certain color, the garb you wear, uh, tell others where you rank on the hierarchy of like a cardinal or a priest. Your, your gym garb kind of ranks you and identifies you as a, as a casual or a hardcore or your type of fitness. Oh, you're a crossfitter, so you wear crossfit gear. Or you're a power lifter, so you need the, the belt and the specific weightlifting shoes. So there's another disciplinary aspect there. Just as the guards and the prisoners each had their own uniforms, so do gym goers in a way. And, and then the staff members too, they usually wearing a uniform that you can identify them as such. And sometimes one of them will go on a patrol through the gym just to make sure everything's okay. And you see one of the corner of your eye and you just, in that moment, make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Similar to what we're talking about uh, in previous weeks with like a police officer, you see the signifier of that while you're driving and you just automatically uh, clam up a little bit. So we've entered the gym, we've gotten dressed, and now what do we do? Now what do you see when you first enter a gym? It's usually a lot of those machines, like a cardio machine, but also like a resistance machines that are organized in a, a circuit. You usually see, um, but not always, uh, like uh, more elderly people on these machines or more the casual fitness enthusiasts and gym goers who are just there and they just want to do a quick simple uh circuit where they don't have to think too much where it's already laid out for them so the gyms advertise these like 30 minute circuits like oh you're busy you got to go to work just drop in 30 minutes just work through the circuit of machines and you're gone and again think about the profit motive here a gym they don't want you staying for too long and hogging all the equipment they want you in and out sometimes they don't want you in at all they just want you to pay for your membership and to never show up but if you do show up they want you just in and out quick 30 minute circuit and then you're out for other people to, to use that equipment so now we've added the machines to this disciplinary structure and the placement of the machines usually in rows and near the front entrance because they're the ones that the gym wants you to use. First of all, there's less liability. There's less 
uh, potential for injury when you're using a machine that has limited range of motion. It's not as dangerous potentially uh, if, than if you're squatting or deadlifting and not don't know what you're doing. So if you go a bit further in the, into the gym, into the belly of the beast, then you get to the free weights, the, the dumbbells and the barbells, the squat racks and whatnot. And again, even if there isn't a staff member, a gym employee right in your direct vicinity, you're going to monitor and surveil and discipline yourself because of the wealth of mirrors there are in every way, in every direction you look in the gym. And again, partially there's a practical purpose for you to check your form, but the, at the same time as you're watching yourself, you are very self-aware. You feel very exposed to the field of visibility. So just as you can easily see yourself, you can see yourself being seen or at least imagine yourself being seen because you can so freely see others. So you realize that you yourself are in that panoptic position so that even if you don't see anyone looking at you, you can kind of feel as if someone may be looking at you. So you discipline yourself. You make sure that you're trying to do everything right and trying to look good and trying to just be a, a good gym member so that gyms don't require as much of the stratification of their space. You know, they don't need a conveyor belt going through the middle of the gym to organize and structure our movements. Uh, they're kind of, that stratification is, is within us. It's internalized so that we act in line without there having to be physical lines directing our behaviors and movements. And just as we, as members, as inhabitants, of the disciplinary space are higher guys according to our uniform, what we're wearing. We're also higher guys according to our knowledge. So who possesses more knowledge within this discourse will be afforded more power, more reverence, a higher social standing. Like there's often the cool group in a gym, the ones who know clearly know what they're doing because they look very fit and then others will see them and try to maybe emulate them or they might feel out of place. They might feel like they deviate from this norm that's been established. And that elite group of gym goers are often friends with the, the staff members there. So it'd be like a prisoner being friends with the guards. Obviously they're gonna be afforded more power and more abilities, even if it's completely unspoken. It's just this subtly legitimized hierarchy of people who are paying the same fees but have different potential for action based on more intangible factors. So the, the, this group and these individuals are often set up as the ideal that others should try to achieve. Just as we mentioned with uh, like morality and how you use that as an internal governor, an internal arbiter of what you need to do to be a good moral person or a good Christian. It's the same thing with being a good gym goer, a good fitness uh, center member a type of person that you're striving to be and emulating in your own actions. So this isn't a physical mirror, but it's a figurative, a metaphorical mirror where you're not just seeing yourself in the mirror, you're seeing the people you want to become. So you act more like them. You might start doing the exercise that they're doing or kind of check out their form and see if you can copy their technique in any way. And that combination of physical structures, such as the mirrors, and the, the lines and rows of machines and the specific placement of the dumbbells and uh, squat racks and whatnot work in conjunction with the non-physical structures, the way we structure ourselves, the social hierarchies all work in conjunction. So even if you're working out by yourself, you're still taking in the structure around you and internalizing it to discipline yourself without ever uh, being told to or interacting directly with someone who's prescribing you to do those things. You just act spontaneously and almost naturally in accordance to what that space wants you to do. So when I was um, at Western, the, the, the university gym, the student rec center, very much had a clear hierarchy of, of like groups in the gym and like the, the power lifters were seen as like this exclusive group. Like they had their own squat rack again it wasn't explicitly stated anywhere that this squat rack is reserved for power lifters but it was just an unspoken norm that it was only allowed for that group of power lifters and not only that rack but other equipment like there were certain barbells 
uh, that were better for powerlifting. So you couldn't be a casual, a casual and use that bar. Otherwise, again, there's no rules against it, but you'd be scoffed at behind your back and judged. There's a lot of uh, silent judging going on where people like look at other people's forms and be like, oh boy, that form's not good. Or, oh, they're using the Texas deadlift bar for their curls in the squat rack. Ugh. So not only is there normalization of certain behaviors and certain uses of the equipment, there's also stigmatization of other behaviors and uses of that space. Like for some reason in that gym culture, powerlifting was put on a pedestal, but there's other completely valid modes of fitness. Like whenever anyone would try to do yoga or work on their flexibility or stretching, they were kind of relegated to like this dusty old mat in the back. And they were probably made to feel a bit uncomfortable and a bit unnatural, like what they were doing was any less valid than what the power lifters were doing. So all of these aspects of the gym as a disciplinary space habituate the mind and the body to a particular activity. It trains us even as we're training ourselves. And even when we're just individually working out, we're just like one of those individual cells in a panoptic prison. Or even in our individuality, we feel the eyes of the masses on us. So we want to fit ourselves into the masses and normalize ourselves and bring ourselves in within the uh, acceptable range of behavior allowed for that space. So this space sets up various norms and implicitly discourages people from deviating from that norm so that without being overtly coaxed, by any staff member or any trainer or any gym manager, we fall in line and conduct ourselves in compliant ways. So I talked a lot about the structuring of space in that previous slide, but also remember that disciplinary spaces structure our sense of time. So think about group fitness classes that take place in these gyms, usually in like a, 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 a cordoned off room or section of the gym. And they got a whole strict schedule throughout the day. Again, usually like 30 minutes to an hour each of you know Zumba classes or I forgot the other names of these classes, but they don't fit our schedule. We fit ourselves into their schedule. We mold ourselves according to the, the sense of time that's been outlined and ordained by the gym so so fitness is not like this chronological activity but we view it as a thing that takes place within this 30 minute time frame on this day and in my case with my gym the entire gym is structured like this now and i'm personally resisting it because i've grown up i've i've worked out for decades in gyms uh before this imposement this imposition of time slots is one hour time slots but if things were like that before I even started working out like a decade ago, then I would have been born into it, so to speak, and it would have felt completely natural to me. And I wouldn't be resisting it the way I am now. And again, in these fitness classes, there's a whole lot of panopticism occurring here. The, the walls are all covered in mirrors. And they call it group fitness, but there's no interactions between the individual group members. They're in their uh individual islands they're individual cells but even when they're individual they're being synchronized with others around them and that's done through the uh the visibility the sheer visibility of everyone and everything how you see your instructors and they see you and you see yourself and you see other uh members of the class and they see you and you know they see you so you act accordingly you want to fit in even though you're an individual island you want to mimic the actions of the kickboxing class or the Zumba class and what everyone else is doing in it. So you're not only monitoring yourself, you're judging yourself in relation to others. You're naturally and automatically comparing yourself to others by saying, oh, this person's more fit than I am, or they're wearing cooler clothes, or they're lifting more weights, or they're doing with better form. And then you judge yourself in relation to that. And change your own conduct, change your own behavior to fit in line with the norm that you see around you. And it's not just visually, it's also uh, sonically and auditorily in terms of these group classes are often accompanied by music. And often in these classes, your movements uh, are in synchronicity with the music, such as like a cycling class. The music is often set up. So during the higher pace segments of the song, you're supposed to go at a higher pace. So it's drilling these behaviors into you 
through multiple senses, not just your sight, but also sound. And all these things ensure that you become the ideal subject of that discourse, of that disciplinary space, where, like I said, they want to reduce costs and maximize profits. And all these things that discipline you into this subject facilitate that and facilitate their uh, capitalist profit motives. So I'd be curious to hear your experience either at a gym or working out outside of a gym. Like I said, a lot of us now have experience with both. And again, not all disciplinary power is evil because I feel less productive working out at home. I don't feel like I'm being watched, which is a good thing in some regards, but at the same time, there's less accountability, right? Because if I were to just give up on this set, no one would uh, implicitly judge me or I wouldn't feel judged and thus probably wouldn't judge myself as harshly as if I were in a public setting like a gym. Again, I'm not saying to avoid gyms for any of these reasons, but it's interesting to be aware of how this power is being wielded in very subtle and nuanced ways and seemingly innocuous everyday spaces such as gyms and fitness centers.